The notion of a spread is one of the biggest scams for 100 years. Banks have been able to get away with it. People don't know what it is. You're not cared about and it's adding all these fees as it goes down the chain. Just middlemen upon middlemen. The biggest benefit of blockchain it doesn't see borders in countries and regions. So why would we restrict on ramps to just one country or one region or whoever has a bank account? We need to change the business models within the crypto industry. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Next Billion podcast, where we're talking to the entrepreneurs, the builders, the people that are building really awesome things. And uh, one of those people joins me today, Rick from Decaf. Rick, how are you going? Good, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Excited. Absolutely. We're going to be talking about the world of payments, money transfers, wallets, on and off ramps, all of these things, which for anyone out there is near and dear to, to my heart. This is how I, I got started in crypto back in the day. So I'm very curious to, to hear what you guys are doing over in, in Latin America and uh, wherever you might see the next hotspot being there. Maybe it's El Salvador, maybe it's uh, somewhere else, but uh, maybe we can, we can just get started. So, so Rick, like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how, did you, how did you get into this crazy crypto clown show? Uh, so far and uh, you know what what sort of led you to the point that you are at today it's definitely a crypto clown show at the moment or at least it feels <laughs> like it I like to sneak that in there when I'm talking things. <laughs> yeah it's uh it's been a wild ride I, I mean I didn't ever think originally I, I'd be in crypto but I actually started in working in FX and fixed income trading and traditional finance I was working at Bloomberg and and specifically focused on those industries and you know I remember helping banks like the central bank of france i remember one day issue helping them issue their bonds and like helping trading and and seeing fx rates and seeing institutional spreads which um were a thing that i realized you know that we couldn't as retail ever achieve and get and and most people or 99 percent of people didn't even know what an fx spread was and you know, I had friends say to me, oh, my bank doesn't charge me anything when I, you know, spend my money overseas. They didn't charge any fees. And then I look at their the transaction <laughs> and, and tell them so that their FX spread, their spread was what well, this happened to me, like really recently, the spread was 9%. And Classic. Uh, this was someone who's spending in Colombia. And uh, they said, oh, it's free. This is the best I can get. And I said, well, that's that's horrendous. And he had no idea. And this is like one of the big banks in America, you know, charging them. And uh, just to clarify how that works, like how does that work? Like when the bank goes out and says it's free, but actually the fee is like hidden on the actual FX that they're doing. So there's no like, hey, it's $2 per transaction when you go to an ATM in Colombia, but actually it's when you, you cash it out, right? Or, or exchange. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's probably really interesting to talk about. So a spread is uh, like the buy and sell rate of the banks. And so if you are, let's say in the US and you travel to Colombia, like my friend, and you want to get Colombian pesos, you will maybe charge your card at the ATM. Maybe there's an ATM fee, which there usually is, but there's also a hidden thing called a spread. And then, and I actually would argue that the notion of a spread is one of the biggest scams that everyone has just accepted for maybe a hundred years or so. And, and it's like, it's it's just a way that banks have been able to just sort of like get away with it for a long time. Cause that's just how it works and that's just how it is. And often people don't know what it is. It's just the rate that they get and that's what they accept. But, you know, only until recently that the spreads have been less, which means essentially the hidden fee uh, because there's more competition and really banks have been getting away with it for a long time. But so what it is, is the, the rate that a bank will sell you this other currency. It's essentially the cost of buying that currency. So they will charge it a percentage away from the middle rate. So there's a, you know, a buy and a sell rate and the percentage away is, is the cost that you, you incur from that. And just so you know, like, it's just a series of middleman fee, really. So what that means is an institution, the reason why I was seeing the institutions getting really small rates, like maybe a fraction of a percentage. So that means a fraction away from the middle rate, the middle rate being the average of the buy and the sell rate, uh, is because they are doing such large volumes that they're able to achieve really, really efficient, liquid, great rates. And so that's really great. But you would think like when you see see how good that rate is, you go, oh, I wish I could get that rate, you know, and I would get like really low fees. But you're so far removed from that in the bank. So it goes something, something like institutional desk in a bank, like I, I used to work with the banks and... And then the institutional desk would get their really high net worth clients or businesses um, would be asking that desk, hey, can you add this 
amount of money to that trade so that we can get some of that rate. And they go, yeah, we'll, we'll add a little fee to that though. And then they would give them a little bit of that order. And then there's a, probably a few other middlemen in that. And uh, then there's the retail bank, which is what you get. And that's like really, really low order and you're not really cared about. And then they're like, oh yeah, we'll give you this much fee to do that trade. And it's just like, you're not cared about. And they're just adding all these fees as it goes down the chain. Just uh, middlemen and, upon middlemen. And this is just that one bank, right? And then in an FX trade, you've got two banks in that trade and an intermediary bank and often multiple intermediaries. And some people have probably lost money at the intermediary bank and the, the two banks in each country don't know where the money's been held. And, and so everyone's taking a cut from this flow. And it's also being used, uh, the traditional payment rail systems like SWIFT when we're doing cross-border. It's something like what... I don't know, uh, FedNow or ACH is in, in the US for people who are listening. But cross-border is like really difficult because not only are you going to two different currencies, you're doing two different payment systems often and you're doing different banks involved. And it's just a bunch of middlemen tacking on fees and hiding that in the notion of spread. And it's time as well, right? Because often, you know, you can't actually send like five cents in pesos cross-border converting from one currency in, say, a US bank to a Colombian bank or something, you can't actually send that through one easy-to-use digital system because it has to go through SWIFT. And then then the question is, like, if you can't do that, yeah. well, how does anyone do payments, right? And it's because they have to, like, bundle them up all at one end, right, and then do it in a bulk trade. So then you have people that are holding on to a bunch of money at a certain time or pre-funding money to the other end to then yes. draw down upon, right? So it's kind of like you just have these piles of money, like, you know, a lot of people at one end are giving in a bunch of money, so the money pile goes higher. And then at the other end, people are getting money out, so the money pile goes lower, right? And you've got to rebalance them at some stage. So, yeah, it seems like... For those unaware with the remittance process, it's very archaic with all of these different systems. But so we can get onto decaf, I think, in a moment. But yeah, sorry, continue with that was a sidetrack. Continue yeah. with the crypto journey. <laughs> yeah. And so I work in, in that sort of FX space and I, I just always had lived abroad as a kind of a digital nomad or just around and always been passionate about this problem. And it's actually why I loved WISE, which is like kind of the benchmark for like a successful remittance technology. Yeah, and they're really good. They're really good, right? Or, or Revolut or Monzo Bank. And, and there was this sort of like wave of fintech that happened back in you know, 2013, 15. With, I'll just say quickly, I was in a pitch competition in Singapore with Revolut back in the day when they were nothing. And now they're like a big thing. So, But we did beat them. So that was good. <laughs> That's amazing because I'm a power user of Revolut. So I, I've been following them since like the early days and huge on that. And and once again, that wave coming out of the UK because of the regulation that happened there. And there's all this fintech and it's like become sort of like the latest, well, the latest wave of really great financial companies has come from that sort of period in the UK. Um, so essentially what Wise did as a, uh, at least initially, was not actually use the banking rails to transfer money. They just use their own sort of pools. And then so if you didn't have to use five middlemen and actually transfer money using traditional rails, you could maybe reduce the fees. And that's what WISE did. And that was their innovation. So yeah, anyway, so that's sort of like my initial work was in finance and I'd studied law and, and worked in commercial financial law as well. And uh, But then I had like this real flip because I just had this calling for a lot of different reasons to, to be an entrepreneur and end up working in, of all things, like gaming tech, VR and AR for like six or seven, seven years, doing like military training, bank training and things like that. And working with companies from all around the world. And ironically, the biggest challenge we had was getting payments from people in Africa or in the US and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Latin America or Europe. And it was just so difficult. And I'm one of those people that lost money at these intermediary banks all the time from clients trying to pay or me trying to send money back to, to Australia at the time. That was where the company was. And uh, it was just like such a nightmare. And I'd always been during that time thinking about or being kind of obsessed with this problem of cross-border payments and payments in general and how slow it was as well. Like I lost that money for I remember when it went to the intermediary bank and the banks couldn't find it. I lost it for like months. And, you know, in business, when you're starting up, it cash flow is everything. And it really, really, really hurt. So just thinking about all this and actually during the, that journey with that company, we created some AR CryptoKitties back in 2017, 18. And we're trading them around and, 
and I was learning about the technology because I thought, wow, this could maybe be an alternative rail to the, once again, my mind, to doing like cross-border payments. And back then when I looked at trading a crypto kitty, one cost me like, I think it was like $50 to send to my friend and the crypto kitty was worth like nothing. And, <laughs> and I just said, well, this is kind of the dumbest technology ever. Like I didn't understand it and it took a while and it wasn't good. So I was like, oh, I lost interest in crypto and I sort of just faded out of it. And I was like, it's, it's not ready. It's not ready for the big time. Come 2021, I see this new technology Solana and and I see how cheap and fast it is and what's going on in the NFT space and was like, this is now ready. This technology could really be used for real financial infrastructure and it should be used for that. And Fernando, who I met in Mexico, who's one of my co-founders, we decided to learn about like NFTs at the time. We launched an NFT collection called Taco Dogs and just to learn the technology and understand how to build on it. And uh, we spent some time doing that. And meanwhile, my brother who was living in Germany who's friends with Juan, these are our two other co-founders, were building also on Solana and, and learning about that. And they won the first hacker house in Portugal back in 2021. And they were like, oh, you happen to be building on Solana as well. We're going to keep, keep going to these hacker houses. And they kept winning the bounties and things like that. So we're like, let's come along and just do it. So we, we were going to all the hacker houses together. And eventually, by the time Chicago came around, we were like, okay, it's really cool to do liquidity bounties. And funnily enough, Fernando and I won a liquidity bounty from FTX uh, for one of the challenges <laughs> they had. So, <laughs> but <Hey>. then that's <laughs> make the most of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, like in the Miami Hacker House, that was the, the same week that FTX had like music festival anyway. Uh, little did we know. <laughs> little did we know. Uh, and yeah, exactly. And so, but it got us into the space because we're really interested into it. And by Chicago Hacker House, we came. We thought, look, this is really cool, the NFT stuff and, and all the liquidity stuff on the exchanges and DeFi, but we're living in Mexico and no one can accept a card payment. And, you know, my whole life has been overseas. Like, can we not do something useful? And we're like, what if you could buy a coffee with crypto, like using Solana? And that's how our name came about, Decaf. We pitched this idea of Decaf, which is decentralized cafe, which is in Spanish, cafe is coffee. So it's like be able to buy coffee with crypto and... That was the idea was born. It was like, let's do payments, especially cross-board payments with technology that doesn't see borders, doesn't see boundaries, is fast and cheaper than traditional means. And we pitched this before Solana Pay existed. And it was kind of crazy at the time. I mean, now it might make a lot more sense, but at the time people were like, well, this is not an NFT project. This is not DeFi. Mm. This is stupid. Crypto had been through cycles of payments before, right? Like back in the yeah. day, it was all about payments. It was all about, we're going to use Bitcoin to buy coffee. But I think what happened is just number went up so much that everyone forgot about that as a use case. And then you had a bunch of people saying, ah, it's not about buying coffee. It's actually about replacing gold and store of value thesis and blah, blah, blah. And then that's how people, I think, probably the transactional stuff ended being a huge thing in the mindset of crypto people, maybe like 2016, and then it went to store of value. And, and then we went on to NFTs and all of these DeFi things. Now it looks like we're coming back full circle as well, because I think, you know, we never really got there to buying a coffee or something. And, and Bitcoin is just too slow and L2s like suck to use. And I'm not going to pre-fund a payment channel to buy a coffee before I can do it like on lightning. That's silly. But now we have things like Solana, as you say, where it's like, oh, actually, maybe now it's fit for purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also just on that user experience of a payment, people love charging things in, in US dollars because everyone understands what that value is. Yeah, look, as you were saying, people understand what a USD transfer is uh, everywhere throughout the world. Whereas if you're charging in units of some coin, it's quite difficult, right? Or, or people are always mentally making a conversion. And it, it's maybe also in some countries, there's parallel exchange rates as well, right? So what's the real rate? You know, Argentinian pesos, you ask a bank and they'll tell you one rate. You ask the guy in the street who's got a wad of USD cash with some fat stacks, like he's going to tell you a different rate, right? So exactly. like what actually is the rate? So then if you're to build an app on that, and then you put an app and you say that you just sent $5 worth of coins. Is it actually $5 worth of coins or exactly. is it 50? Who knows? Like, it, exactly. and how do you get the rate? There's no API, it's dudes on the street. So like, yeah, it's things like that, I guess, for pricing, it just makes more sense, right? To just sort of be sending around stable coins or, or making use of stable coins perhaps. 
Absolutely, and it goes to the point of transparency, right? If you know a thing costs five dollars, and you know you're paying a stable coin worth of five dollars, you know your rate is one to one. That's kind of the the difficult thing with the user experience of Bitcoin payments, right? You're charging in US dollars, but you're getting some sort of Bitcoin rate. Is that rate like what's the percentage there, and how is that? It's not very transparent. It's really difficult. And goes it's back it's annoying. I mean, back in the day, I remember there was a 1.5% premium in Indonesia when we were doing our remittances. And often I would be pre-funding in advance, locking in the 1.5% rate. And then it would be about trying to backfill that, right? So if you take 50K and you go and buy a whole bunch of rupiah, you make 1.5%, cool, now it's sitting in rupiah. Cool, who's going to come with 50K in the next 24 hours while the rates are still viable for me to do 1.5%? What if it moves more than 1.5% in the next few days? Then I'm wrecked. So I need to offload it really quick, right? So you need a stable flow as well of people doing it. a lot of things to manage, you know, when you're trying to manage this. We can get on to like El Salvador. People are using Bitcoin for stuff there, right? Like, is that how people think of it? Or is a coffee still in dollars? Or is it 0.0182846 Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Bitcoin here is legal tender. I'm here in El Salvador right now. I should mention that. I came to check it out and say like, hey, is this Bitcoin payments thing working? And how are people doing payments here? So while I can walk down to the Bitcoin sort of city and see Strike and Bitcoin payments accepted in like a lot of businesses, right? Like it's, it's all across, you can see the signs everywhere. That's quite cool. But at the end of the day, I'm paying for everything in dollars at the end of the day. I'm using cash and that's what everyone else is using. Sometimes card, but pretty much just only cash. And mm. so, I mean, as a user experience, especially for the locals, everyone knows dollars everyone's charging in dollars and I actually haven't tried a strike payment yet because I'm I'm international I'm Australian I can't get a strike account that's a problem it's uh, a bitcoin wallet thing or something right is it or is it the wallet that El Salvador's done themselves or something like that what what is a strike so to be honest like you have a strike wallet I've tried to use it to do a bit of research but I can't use it because you need to be a US person and uh it doesn't work for me unfortunately yeah strike. Are you Australian, by the way? You're Australian, right? I, I may uh, at one stage have grown up on that prison island, yes. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> many so, years ago, and uh, I, I am not associated with the prisoners anymore. So uh, I got out. <laughs> I, can, I can understand and relate. Yeah, yeah, I can understand and relate. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's not really it's not really that open, right? So, mm. um and a lot of people who are doing crypto payments, at least what we're finding in Decaf, are, are digital nomads, especially yes. in businesses like this. Uh, a lot of the Bitcoiners that are coming are, are not local El Salvadorians, they're Americans, uh, which is great for Strike because they service those sort of people. And I tend to use the, um, the wallet of Satoshi. I think you could probably use any non-custodial Lightning wallet, so that's, that's fine. But at the end of the day, it's sort of like, how do I get... Bitcoin. And this is actually the problem. Like I really wanted to test at the immigration, I could actually pay with Bitcoin to get my immigration pass to get into the country. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's very cool. But actually on the way here, I'm like, well, how do I get Bitcoin? Like it's a nightmare. I, I can't do it. And, and if I do do it, I get charged like an arm and a leg. Maybe I can go through Coinbase, which I don't really want to. It's just like such a horrible sort of experience. Um, it is. It's like the assumption is that either you already have a stash sitting there natively and not say in a wrapped coin that's on Solana WBTC in a yield farm making you more money or yeah what else like you're already selling your goods and services in Bitcoin which I guess is the that's the holy grail right is that everyone in the world starts selling their goods and services and their time and their productivity in a cryptocurrency because then it's not a problem anymore right if, if we if we work and we get our salary in crypto we don't need an on and off ramp anymore. It's it's done. It's end of story, done deal, right? But the reality is that, you know, we're not there yet and there is some interim period. Well, I would argue that getting your payment in crypto is the on ramp. And so I will actually say that during our learnings of, so we, we worked with Solana Spaces as the point of sales and we did the payments and it was great. We had like the Solana community and whoever could get USDC on Solana to, to make payments from their non-custodial wallets worked beautifully. It was super fast. It was awesome. I've seen it. Yeah, very slick. Yeah, they had $500,000 worth of USDC payments within six months. It's really cool. But when an average person in Miami walked past that stall, jumped in, spent 15 minutes 
writing down that seed phrase, learning about what a non-custodial yeah. wallet is, uh, and then going to the only option in their wallet, MoonPay, who would charge about 10% at the time to get USDC for $100. It was just like people criticize, well, why can't I pay for my coffee in crypto yet? And it's not actually about like adoption of payments and people wanting to pay in crypto. It's about on and off ramps. That's really what this is. Like payments yes. is an off ramp. The on ramp is really what we need. And that is the bigger question for whether payments or not get mass adoption. And this is what we learned. And so it's actually while we started as a payments like from merchant POS, we realized, oh my God, we have to do the wallet because that's actually the point of entry for everyone into the ecosystem. And once again, I think the goal and the name of this podcast is the next billion, how we get a billion people into this ecosystem. And if that's the best state of UX for getting into a non-custodial wallet, then we're doomed. We're never going to get non-crypto people to come into this. So we built a wallet and we made it so you could sign in with what looks like a Web2 sort of sign and you could do Google login or email or, you know, eventually phone number we'll have. But we did it through some Shamir sharing on, on a wallet so people could go always get their keys and they have control. We can't touch their money. It's still non-custodial, but it just makes it quick and easy as to get that wallet straight up and running. But the next challenge and the bigger challenge is we still have on-ramps that A, have low spreads or fees and two are just easy and available to people, not just in one country or region, but everywhere. Because I, I would argue that the biggest benefit of blockchain is that it doesn't see borders in countries and, and regions. So why would we restrict on ramps to just one country or one region or whoever has a bank account? You know, these, this is the challenge of the on ramp. I want to ask the question, how do we solve that? But I think firstly, it's worth pointing out to people like what's actually involved in say setting up an on-ramp or or why is it so hard why aren't there 50 million people that all have on-ramps and all of these businesses everywhere that are you know everyone using these on-ramps maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well like so what is involved with an on or and what is an on-ramp as well like i have say a us dollar balance in a bank account in the us and i walk into a store or maybe i'm on holiday in el salvador and it's like cool how do I pay in crypto for that thing over there? How do I get my money from, from that bank over there, over here now? What's the process? Awesome. I think maybe a lot of your listeners are, listeners are from the US. So I'll use US as an example and an analogy. So how do you get money into Cash App? How do you get money into Venmo? How do you get money into Zelle? Which by the way, is probably the largest app in all of Venezuela, even though it's in the US. And that's what everyone's paying with, with Zelle. And essentially, like, for example, looking at Zelle, it's just created its own payment rails and it's using RTP. I think it's the only app that uses RTP, which is probably the best rails that exist in the US, but it's not available to everyone. So, I mean, you could look at like, why would not all banks make this available to everyone? Maybe there's a reason that they keep them slow and keep that control. But anyway, so imagine if we could have a crypto wallet be as easy to fund as your cash app or Venmo. But instead of it using like a centralized ledger, we're using crypto as the payment rail. So that would be the ultimate on-ramp, let's, let's say. And then off-ramp, the same way as a cash app would go back to your bank account, or maybe like a MoneyGram, you can get your cash out through traditional banking rails. Like all it would be doing is essentially replacing the rails of what everyone uses in the US, like Venmo or Cash App. So that would be just through a decentralized ledger rather than a centralized ledger. And the reason why we'd use a decentralized ledger is because once again, it doesn't have or see any borders or boundaries. So imagine a Cash App that worked everywhere in every country, and we could just have that seamless off-ramp and on-ramp in whatever region you're in. That is, I think, the biggest promise of crypto. And it is, and I think that's where we need to get to for onboarding a billion people. But I'll take the uh, the devil's advocate position here, and I'll say that if you have a cash app or a, you know a Venmo or something, right, you can do Venmo to Venmo instantly for free. I, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I've never used it, but probably right. Actually, internally, they just have a pile of money sitting in their bank account and they just have a database internally that matches these two payments, right? So if I'm to put it into the app, actually, I'm doing Venmo to Venmo. So the app, okay, so the app needs to have a Venmo account. 
Then let's say you want to do Cash App as well. Same deal. Cash App, they have their own pile of money and their own database that's just saying this person, this person. The problem arises when you actually want to cross between different, let's say, pastures yes. uh, or like piles of money, right? Can I do a Venmo to a Cash App? And do I need a middleman? I, I don't know, maybe, but, uh, or a PayPal. Uh, can I go straight to an email address from one of these things? Often they're not connected, right? So that's where the banks come in and they go, hey, well, your Venmo pile of money that's owned by Venmo.com Corporation, integrated, whatever, you have to then leave that pile of money. The bank has to transfer it somewhere else, maybe yes. to the wallet app. And yes. then now the wallet app has the money, right? So I guess the, the point is, these different payment rails, is that a solvable problem? Is it just something that, I guess as an entrepreneur, you have to just focus on the most important methods? Like there's thousands of methods throughout the world. In fact, my friend Faisal Khan, which everyone should go check out Faisal if you don't know. He's uh, one of the remittance dudes in the world and knows everything. He said there's 2,000 different individual payment methods with banking just being one. So yes. that's a lot of different methods, right? And they don't talk to each other. You know, whether it's Bcash in Bangladesh or, you know, mobile money in Kenya or Venmo in the US, like they're not connected. So how do we connect them? Totally. And that's that's the billion dollar question. Uh, so let's look at what, first of all, you're right. You cannot interact with two ecosystems. They're all closed ecosystems. So not even only can you not just like pay someone with Cash App on Venmo or through a bank on Venmo or, or anything like that. So they're all closed. Uh, but when we look at like foreigners, I'm only guessing what Cash App and Venmo is like from what I've been told. I can't use it. <laughs> I've never been able to use it. So, uh, and I've had a lot of Americans say, oh, yeah, I'll Cash App and Venmo you. And I'm like, I would love that, but I can't have <laughs> Literally that. can't. Yeah. yeah, literally can't. And and that's like a concept that's like sometimes for people who have never done anything with a, someone overseas or cross border and seeing a different ecosystem or a different place, these boundaries are just like limitless. There's so many. and So many. So many. But that's the beauty of blockchain it's like there are none of these boundaries not only are they just no boundaries with certain closed ecosystems within a domestic sphere but internationally there's no boundaries either and how do we get then money from a bank which is the on-ramp by the way or from cash in a local currency into blockchain and the way to do it is through the notion of tokenization like what usdc has done or circle has done with usdc or you know various stable coins and they essentially get that pool of cash, put it into a bank account or treasuries, whatever, and then they tokenize it and it's backed one-to-one -one with uh, those uh, assets in the bank account. So, and then now it's tokenized and it can run on an efficient blockchain like Solana, just at the speed of light, you know, 400 milliseconds to settle a USDC transaction rather than three to five days if I was to do something maybe overseas or cross-border. Yeah. And so I guess what we're talking about here is you have this say this central hub, right? And you can connect all of these these different apps to it for people to pay in their local domestic, however that might be. But yes. once it's in crypto, now that is actually the portability rails. Because the thing is, let's say I have Venmo, you know, in the US and then I have some other thing in some other country in El Salvador, which is totally different. These two things are never going to be integrated with each other, right? Venmo is not going to you know, talk to Safaricom and add payments in Tanzania anytime soon, right? Because sure, they could do that, but there's also a million other things that they could do and, and different payment providers. So it's kind of like you're not going to connect yourself to 2,000 individual different integrations. It's too much work. But maybe if everyone connected to that one, you know, central hub of thing called crypto, then yeah. maybe that is the way, right? And and once you're connected there, it's like this hub and spoke model where you have everyone just able to communicate on the same layer, the same everything. Hey, did a payment happen? I can prove it. It's on a blockchain. Whereas, hey, did a payment happen in my bank? I don't know, man. I mean, it's 5 p.m. on a Sunday and the bank hasn't been open for 48 hours. You're going to have to wait until 9 a.m. By the way, you're in a different country. 9 a.m. is different. So <laughs> like, you know, all of this kind of stuff, right? So yep. yeah, it's uh, it, it seems like that's the way to go. So let's talk a little bit about DCAF, right? You, you were talking about the Solana spaces and, and you had a POS type of system for payments. What is DCAF now today? And we've spoken about on and off ramps. Is this something you guys are looking to solve? What is your current sort of business and, and what are people doing with DCAF today? 
Yeah, so I'd just like to mention that the POS is still running. It runs at all the Solana events and hacker houses, and we're doing collaboration with Samo and the Monster team to yeah. do this in payments, which is, yeah, been super cool. They're awesome, amazing, and I'm, educating. I'm not wearing my Samo shirt today. I've been wearing it for the last two podcasts. So ah, no. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, t- the team is amazing. Like, they're really driving towards this utility thing. And and for us, like, the reason we've, we're have we still focusing on that, and we, we want for example, that POS to be here in El Salvador. That's why I'm here. It's like, well, you could do USDC payments on Solana. It makes way more sense than doing it on Bitcoin. And the reason it will make more sense is because we need to solve and we will solve the on-ramp problem. That is what our learnings has told us as to when adoption will happen. So let's solve that. And that's what we've sort of shifted to. Not only have we got a non-custodial wallet that just makes it really easy, whole goal, once again, like you probably heard it a million times, your grandma can use, but it's not just the user experience of a non-custodial wallet and having your keys, right? It is the on-ramp, which is the connection to domestic local currency. How do we get that seamless as Cash App or Venmo or Zelle? How do we do that? We know that Zelle worked in Venezuela, for example. It's borderless money, but they get the accounts shut down and one person's account is used for like 500 people sometimes, you know? (laughs) <laughs> and then someone has to fly over to Miami and reopen it. And, and it's like kind of illegal, but it's not really. It's kind of just looked at. Whack-a-mole kind of yeah. thing. People just play that game. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, how do we solve that on-ramp problem is the first question. And then if we're looking cross-border, how do we get the off-ramp problem or solve the off-ramps as well? And one of the things that we've done with our wallet is partner with MoneyGram, which now allows you to get your USDC out in 184 countries for zero fees and a really tight spread, like the FX spread, like we talked about, like the tightest we've seen. This is something amazing, I think. So I use this all the time. I'm in El Salvador, I'm getting cash out here. I actually get dollars out in El Salvador. And then I can go to, I I do it in Colombia, Argentina, I do it in Mexico. And the cool thing about that is not that I can just get local currency out with my USDC, it's that I can hold my USDC or US dollar value in places like, for example, Argentina, where inflation is 100% or over 100%. And the devaluation of the currency is so high that if you pay with a card, often at a, like a business, the amount of times it takes to settle on a card payment in Argentina, they charge 10% because of the currency fluctuation and volatility. By the time they get their money, it's probably, it can be worth within like 30% less within four days, you know, or- yeah. There's one day that they drop like 20%, you know, against the US dollar. So people being able to hold US dollar is so valuable. By the way, the government actually blocks people from buying US dollars there. Uh, not everyone can. And the people who can can only get $200 a month maximum. And everyone would obviously do that. And I think it's the country in the world that has the highest amount of US dollars under mattresses. So, and that's for that reason. It's just like they have no wealth protection at all. So, not only is it a beautiful thing giving people an equivalent of a US dollar bank account holding USDC on a non-custodial wallet, they own it. It's like it's under their mattress, but they can also do way more with it and they can get it out in their local currency whenever they want in cash and spend. And this is a huge deal, like partnering with one of these existing on and off ramps that already exist everywhere in the world. I remember back in the day when we tried to do similar things, like they said, no, we don't like crypto, go away. Um, it seems like they've uh, they've softened their stance these days, or at least perhaps said, hey, and this is what I told people years ago, this is a revenue opportunity for you guys. It's like, do you want more people visiting your shops? Yeah, yes. Okay, well, you should partner with crypto apps that are doing innovative things and and all this kind of stuff, right? And then I guess maybe another thing, and we, we spoke about a little bit before the call, there's maybe other you know, features that can be offered like within the decaf app. Maybe that's staking or maybe that's, like you mentioned the the POS sort of services are still operational. There's actually a lot of things you can do, right? It's not just, I guess that the core focus is on and off ramps, right? But there's scope to do more things. Absolutely. So I look at MoneyGram as a great off ramp, right? What's the other off ramp? And the first one we focused on was payments at the point of sale. That is the ultimate off ramp. And actually the way I got into this was actually another Australian guy like yourself, George, who was in Colombia. And he had an exchange there and he was delivering millions of dollars of Colombian pesos cash every month to Venezuelans crossing the border who had all their money in Bitcoin. And they couldn't spend their Bitcoin to live. 
and they couldn't get bank accounts because they have no ID. They're refugees often, or they're like just lost and they, they needed cash to survive. And that was like, that stuck with me for years during the pandemic, I was in Colombia and I couldn't believe it. And they couldn't get enough cash for them at all. Uh, like they just could not get enough cash to these Venezuelans and even some Colombians as well to live because they held all their net worth in Bitcoin, which was essentially a proxy to dollars to save wealth or make money as well. So this was just like an obvious problem, right? And actually our MoneyGram integration right now is actually just seen tremendous growth in Colombia. It's because of the same reason, the same groups of people that need this cash from their crypto to, to actually spend in real everyday life. Now, the first step in that journey is to have an off-ramp that is into cash because now I can spend it on groceries or whatever, or houses, you can buy houses, like or wherever, whatever. But then the next step is just pay directly with crypto and get rid of the need for the local currency. And that's that we're not there yet. So we have to recognize that. And for now, we have to have off good off ramps. And then there's the on ramp. But yeah, absolutely. And I think it's about providing people the options now to be using these things to then perhaps learn about step two, step three down the track. Cool. Once you have a decaf wallet, once you've done this a few times, once you got your cash, Cool. Maybe there's, you know, you, you learn a little bit more about crypto and you're like, well, maybe what else can I do with this USDC? You know, can I, can I do anything else there? Well, there's a whole wide world of crypto ecosystem out there for you to go and look at. But so this is great, right? And this is solving real problems. It's about this time that I'm asking what's going on for the rest of 2023 uh, for you guys. So we're about halfway through the year now. A lot of people say that there's a rise of DeFi in Solana, or at least it's coming back. I think TVL is back to pre-FTX now or, or doing pretty well, at least from where it's been. But um, what are some of the focuses for you guys for the rest of this year in building this out and, and maybe core things that you're working on? I think this is like really good information, like how we're seeing the future. And I'm really excited about this. So I think some of your listeners will get some like good scoops on what I'm super excited about. So we will continue to work with other on and off ramps. So MoneyGram, we're working with Rio across Latin America. We're starting to do integrations across Africa as well, because we're starting to see a lot of demand for off ramps in, in Africa and on ramps. So we'll continue to do that. One of the big challenges that we want to do, uh, so maybe some people are asking, well, why can't you do the on ramp like Venmo or Cash App? So with crypto, the US government makes it, well, relatively difficult because you need a lot of licenses, uh, exchange licenses, uh, money transmission licenses. And currently the people who hold them, especially for the crypto industry, are charging quite a lot, like a significant amount. And once again, we talk about spread and what are you paying for and who are the current on, on ramps. Uh, I think they're not really catering towards utility. They're catering towards people who are trying to buy things on or just do speculation and trading and go to the moon. So people don't really care so much about spreads. So we're, we're thinking about solving that problem ourselves and just the way that we solve it would be, how do we just get as many people on ramped with, and we reduce the prices and we don't look at monetizing that on ramp. So adding a middleman fee, like we just want to get rid of that because we want as many people into this ecosystem because there's so much opportunity there. Uh, so that would be one thing, solving that on ramp problem. I'm not exactly sure how, maybe we, we create it ourselves or we find better partners and we drive better collaborations to solve that problem. That's the real frontier. Because once again, most of US dollar remittances or sending money abroad is coming from the US. So let's solve the problem in the US. Now, the only ones who are doing it at the moment are exchanges or, or like MoonPay, and they have to spend millions of dollars to get these licenses. And and it's 50 states, state by state as well, right? And yeah. you go to California, that'll be $2 million that you have to pay to the state or something that sits there and you never get anything from it. You go to some other place, Florida, I think it's a lot cheaper and some of them are like, but it's like, cool. All right, come back to me when you have $30 million to just, just to even apply for the licenses to get them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the ones that do have the licenses are either charging an arm and a leg and passing that on to everyone else or... They just keep people in their ecosystem, think of the exchanges, and they do not want money to go overseas or out of their ecosystem. And they just like creating a closed loop system once again, like the custodial exchanges. So that's one thing. Now, another thing that I'm really, really excited about, you're saying there's a rise of DeFi. I probably am one of very few people who hold this view. The thing that I'm most excited about with DeFi is once again, tokenization. So tokenization, I think can offer the opportunity to get real world investments that are maybe not available 
to people. So I don't know if you know this, but in Mexico right now, you can invest in the government bond and you can get 11.4% return. So there's a lot of hype on the, at the moment about getting like, you know, four and a half to 5% on the treasuries in the US. But most people in the US can't access these amazing next door opportunities that yield something better than even staking on, on Solana, for example. But what if we were able to tokenize these investments and pass on the returns to the token holders, you know, like a stable coin, but stable coin with coupon returns from the bonds that it's sitting in. This is something that we're going to offer and we're working with a partner called Etherfuse and it's going to be backed by the government. Now, this is a huge sort of exciting development. It's not like I think the DeFi opportunity for tokenization of real world assets will happen in the countries that are looking to innovate. And that's unfortunately not in the US right now. It's happening while well, I'm sitting in El Salvador. Bitcoin is a legal tender here. Digital assets are completely legal here. It's dollar. There's no Gary Gendler's like, you know, walking down the street going, are you guys doing something with Bitcoin? I don't like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then a major player, Mexico, with a huge economy. And it, by the way, if you looked at the Mexican pesos, it's absolutely skyrocketing against the dollar because everyone's doing institutions who have access to these these bonds are making this trade. It's carry trade is at an all time high because it's like, That's why crazy. would you not? So not only are you going to get the you know, increase in the pesos, it's just continuing to go higher and higher against the US dollar. So why not? So in Mexico, the government there is actually looking to support this as an actual offering for international investors through tokenization. And this will be run on potentially like Stellar or Solana, you know, the two blockchains that are just super efficient, super, super high performance. So I think like this is the thing that I am most excited about. To me, it's like sustainable yield actually backed by innovators and, and governments as well. And it's really safe. It's really safe, but it really yields a great amount. And this is what I truly think is like the game changer for blockchain in general or this technology. So while I'm excited about some of the opportunities within DeFi and the actual like ecosystems itself, what if we got the tokenization of really good investments in traditional finance and this high interest rate environment and make it available to anyone on blockchain? That's awesome. So I think what we're going towards is maybe a future like what Elon's trying to get to with this X being the super app, right? I, I, it's taking inspiration from WeChat and things like that. And I don't know if you've used WeChat, but a lot of apps in Asia, you can get financial instruments of a million different things. You can do everything in the app. You can chat. You, but I think being able to provide people something like tokenized government bonds, very safe investment bonds, especially government bonds, depends on the country, of course. But I think people recognize that being able to have the ability to do this just at your fingertips would be amazing, especially if it's connected to crypto, because then we don't have all of those walled, I call them walled gardens, where essentially, oh, you're not a, a citizen of uh, Mexico. Well, I guess you can't do that because you need a phone number or, of there. Or, But if it's, if it's tokenized and if it's on chain, well, now it's open to everyone in the world. And, and don't you want to attract everyone in the world to, to go and use your thing? Absolutely. And the reason why also I'm really excited about this opportunity for tokenization is it provides an opportunity for different types of monetization. And this is the big thing that I would, if there's one thing that people remember from this, it's that we need to change the business models within the crypto industry. Let's get rid of middleman fees for on-ramps because they just provide friction. None of this makes sense if we can't get seamless on-ramps and off-ramps, but most of all on-ramps. So I think this sort of tokenization is the competitive advantage of these new rails. And if we can start using monetization as assets under management because everyone's getting into the ecosystem, great. Now let's let builders make money in better ways and more sustainable ways. And let's have give access to more people because we're not just replicating the old middleman takes a fee flow of the past and the other industries. And, and this is what I think is really going to drive it forward. And then the one thing that I will say is, with the on and off ramp partners that we're we're collating, we are launching decaf pay. So you can actually get USDC or if you have USDC, you can use it. And we just want to strip away everything. And it is like the wallet, it is the wallet, but it just does one thing and it sends money abroad. So you can just use it to send money abroad. And that's like decafpay.com. It'll be up pretty soon and live. We're just changing a few things in the messaging because we want to play on side with the regulators. Uh, because we're once again using non-custodial 
wallets. It's not us transmitting anyone's money. It's you doing it yourself. We just want to provide the easiest flow to do that within the world of blockchain. Amazing. Well, definitely everyone go and check out Decaf. I know members of the STEP team are using Decaf very often in their world travels. So go and check it out. Where should people go to find out more blogs, social media, websites, apps? Where, where should we go? We try and keep our Twitter updated as much as possible with every new development and what we're doing. So decaf underscore SO or so. That's where we, I would encourage everyone to go. We also have a lot of articles and information on our medium and our website is decaf.so and that has more information there. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Rick. It's been a pleasure. This is something that, this is how we onboard a billion people is if we want a billion people doing crypto things, there needs to be on and off ramps from the fiat world. And and there is this interim period where not everyone is earning their salary in, in crypto direct. And we have to deal with these nation state currencies. And the question is, what's the easiest way? And, and it seems like decaf is, is definitely on the right path. So thank you so much for your time today uh, coming on the podcast. And we'll put some links as well up here, down there, somewhere else uh, for, for where to go. But uh, thanks for your time today, Rick. Yeah, really appreciate being on the show. It was, it was quite fun. It was really fun. Awesome. Cheers. Bye-bye.